of the work that went on last summer, of course, included the shallow water as well. So there actually were three buoys in the lake. Those of you that are on the lake or off probably are aware of that. But so what you've just heard is based on John's experience interpreting that information from that deep water buoy and his tributary sampling. And Dr. Matthews will be focused on the information it's all preliminary at this point. We haven't given him much time to even consider that data. But uh, he's going to share what he can in terms of conclusion that may be drawn at this point from the shallow water data. So uh, Dr. Matthews from the Upstate Freshwater Institute, welcome aboard, and thanks for your participation. Thank you very much, Bob. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out on this cold, uh, nasty day. Um, I'm impressed uh, by the number of people that are here and that are, are passionate about this lake and, um, and seem to really care. Um, as Bob mentioned, this is a work in progress, but this is a great opportunity um, for me to uh, communicate to you folks uh, what we've learned to date. This was a collaborative project with um, Kim Schulz from SUNY ESF. Um, a lot of her work is going to be done in, in 2017, um, but this was something that we, uh, we went into together and have been working on um, diligently together. And thank you, John, for figuring this uh, remote out for me. I'm sure I won't have any, any problems. Um, so harmful algal blooms um, in freshwater systems and in Owasco Lake are caused by cyanobacteria. Um, we also call them blue-green algae. And, um, and we lump them in with algae, although we should re always remember that they are, in fact, bacteria. They're not plants. And they come in many shapes and sizes. Some of them are single-celled or unicellular. Um, those guys typically are not a water quality problem. Um, some of them are filamentous, so they form long strings, um, and some form large colonies. Uh, and most of them tend to float. So other algae, green algae, diatoms, for example, may be in the water in similar quantities, but they aren't a nuisance because we don't see them. They don't wash up on our shorelines. Uh, there are um, many, many... Uh, taxa of uh, cyanobacteria in New York State. Uh, the big troublemakers tend to be microcystis, anabena, and phanazominin. In Owasco Lake, the major players have been uh, microcystis and anabena. And as we know, sometimes uh, cyanobacteria produce toxins, and these include hepatotoxins, which um, are toxic to the liver, uh, toxins uh, which cause problems in the nervous system, and toxins which can call, cause problems on our skin. Uh, here are some um, uh, micrographs which nicely show microcystis, which is a colonial bacteria, and abena. These are single cells that form uh, kind of a coiled string, and amphanazomin, and they tend to look kind of like blades of uh, grass. So what are the conditions that favor cyanobacteria over other forms of phytoplankton? And we should always remember that this really is a competition. Phytoplankton and cyanobacteria are competing for light. They're competing for nutrients. Uh, high elevations of nutrients, in particular phosphorus, but perhaps also nitrogen, tend to favor cyanobacteria in this competition. They also um, do well um, at the low levels of the N to P ratio. And um, they can also be promoted by uh, zebra and quagga mussels. Um, in one way, by selective filtration, these mussels just filter water. They keep what they want to eat, and what they don't like, they spit back out. They tend not to like cyanobacteria, so that activity f 
favors the growth of cyanobacteria. Also, these mussels are really, really great at uh, recycling nutrients, resulting in high nutrient levels in the water column. Um, so part of our work was to focus on what's going on with their populations in Owasco Lake. Warm water temperatures also favor cyanobacteria, as John mentioned, and they, they like calm conditions. Calm conditions allow them to float up to the top, get the sunlight, and block out other algae that don't float. So this work was uh, guided by a number of research questions, some of which uh, Kim and I had, and others which um, other folks uh, in the watershed were interested in. And essentially, we're trying to, to better understand the enemy here. Um, we need to know as much as we can about these guys um, in order to uh, try to abate them in this system. And one fundamental question is, has algal growth in general increased in Owasco Lake as a result of increased nutrient loading? Um, we don't know if it has or not, haven't demonstrated that. Or are we simply witnessing a change in uh, phytoplankton community composition? Um, these are our big questions and we should uh, try to do our best to answer them before we move into real aggressive management. Um, also, are HABs in Owasco Lake um, a lake-wide phenomenon? Do they grow everywhere? Or do they just grow in these nearshore areas where they, we see them wash up on the bank? For example, are, are nutrients from streams creating localized high phosphorus concentrations and we're seeing blooms form there in situ? Um, also curious whether there are large spatial differences in water quality as you go down the main axis of the lake that may somehow trigger HABs, say for example in the north end rather than in the south end of the lake. Um, another question is, is, is there any evidence that cyanobacteria are migrating up and down in the water column? Um, they're known to, to migrate down to lower waters where there's more nutrients, and they'll do that at night. And then when they're full of nutrients, they'll float up to the top and get in the light, and they'll do that day after day. Um, and um, it, it's important to understand whether they're doing that or not and where they may be getting their nutrients. And... Um, Finally, have zebra and quagga mussel uh, populations changed, and, and does it look like they're contributing to this increase in harmful algal blooms? So I'm not going to answer all these questions today. I'm not sure I'm going to answer any of them, but I'll, I'll tell you what we've learned um, to date. So our 2016 monitoring program um, had a number of components. First of all, we deployed water quality monitoring buoys in two nearshore areas that have been shown to have HABs historically. These buoys make measurements every 15 minutes at a fixed depth, not like John's buoys that profile. These make measurements at about a meter, meter and a half below the water surface, but they're located in shallow water anyway. No, no real need to profile. Um, and they were deployed from uh, late July through about mid-October. Um, also at these two sites, we collected water samples that we brought back to the lab to analyze for nutrients, including three forms of phosphorus and two forms of nitrogen. We collected uh, uh, water samples every two weeks, and we also serviced the buoys at that time um, so over this July 21 to October 12 interval, we collected a total of nine samples. We also used um, uh, rapid profiling equipment, a seabird, to make vertical profiles of water quality parameters at four sites down the main axis of the lake to look for spatial gradients in water quality. And this year, we're going to do a detailed uh, benthic survey looking at zebra and quagga muzzle uh, populations. We did a, a quick peek last year and did discover that quagga muzzles are in the lake. They appear to be in the lake in fairly large numbers 
um, which was uh, news to us. So here are the uh, monitoring locations. The buoys were deployed up near the mouth of Sucker Brook and near the mouth of Dutch Hollow Brook. Again, two areas um, that have seen algal blooms in the past. And the, the rapid profiling was done at four sites down the main axis of the lake. The buoys measured uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, chlorophyll, which is a measure of algal biomass, specific conductance, which you can think of as um, analogous to salinity or the saltiness of the water, um, turbidity, and also blue-green algae, and they made these measurements every 15 minutes. Um, also measured total phosphorus, total dissolved phosphorus, insoluble reactive phosphorus, nitrate, ammonia, silica, which is an important nutrient for diatoms, a different type of phytoplankton. And we collected samples for um, um, identifying and counting phytoplankton and zooplankton in the lab. All right, here's, uh, here's some data. And we're gonna spend the next hour going through this in great detail. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, so it, 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 it's an awful lot of uh, um, data, a lot to look at. Um, haven't looked at it all in great detail yet, but um, at least to give you a, a, a sense for the data we collected today, we're going to just focus in on the blue-green algae concentrations, this bottom panel. And these are data from near the mouth of Sucker Brook, so up in the northeast corner of the lake. And so this is a time series running from uh, July through mid-October. These are all the 15-minute me measurements going up and down. And the red arrows are documented blooms that occurred in the area of the buoy. And so in a perfect world, every time we saw a red arrow, we'd see a spike in blue-green algae concentrations. You're probably not impressed, are you? I, I wasn't either. It's kind of hit and miss. Nothing there. Nothing there. Maybe there's a little bump there. This is pretty nice. This was a more sustained um, bloom, and we did see a response. Hard to say much about that. Um, we anticipated that in the middle of a, a significant algae bloom, these levels should have been up at least 10, maybe 100, um, if it was a really intense bloom. Uh, we didn't see that. Same data uh, near the mouth of Dutch Hollow Brook, a little further south on the east shore of the lake. And again, we're going to zoom in and look at the blue-green algae levels. And again, um, not too impressed. Yeah, okay, this one maybe, you know, maybe a little better here, but in general, it's hit and miss. We really can't say that this sensor is doing a great job of predicting or identifying blooms that are being documented on the shoreline. So why, why might this be? Um, what we typically saw out at these locations, which were only a few hundred feet into the lake, they were um, just deep enough so that we could deploy the buoy. Um, typically what we saw was something like this. So you, you, you could see a green tint in the water, look kind of grainy. Actually, these are all individual uh, microcystis colonies by and large. But the water was clear. Typically, our secchi disc was laying on the bottom of the lake. We could see it clearly. Uh, no evidence of what we would call bloom levels of cyanobacteria. However, when uh, Tim Schneider at Outlip was doing his monitoring on the shoreline, he's seeing this stuff. 
And there doesn't seem to be a strong connection between what we're seeing only a few hundred feet into the lake um, and what he's seeing right on the bank. The other tricky thing is that these guys float. And although our sensor is pretty shallow, only about three or four feet deep, it may be too deep and underneath where the most intense concentrations of cyanobacteria are. Um, so, you know, this suggests that perhaps these blooms aren't forming here. This is the same stuff. It's just being pushed up against the bank where it's accumulating. So uh, one of our other questions was, are there uh, important spatial variations in water quality as you move down the main axis of the lake? And these are very similar to the profiles uh, uh, John uh, presented earlier, pretty much the same instrument. Um, and what we're doing here is showing individual parameters, temperature, at the four sites, sites one through four, all on August 4th. So the guys just went down the lake, dropped the instrument, made the measurements. And um, temperatures, uh, nothing noteworthy there. Salinity, the water seemed to be slight, slightly more saline um, down where the major input to the lake is. Not a big surprise there. The water was, was a little more turbid in the north end, uh, which was a bit surprising, um, but not high turbidities by any sense. And we did see subsurface peaks in chlorophyll or phytoplankton biomass. Um, the strongest peaks were um, near the north end of the lake. Um, one takeaway from this might be um, if you wanted to avoid algae, um, you'd probably want a drinking water intake down below 20, 30 meters in, in that range. Uh, up here is not a good place to take your drinking water if you have a choice. So we did the same monitoring again on the 15th of September. And again, not uh, much difference in water temperature. Conductivity was very similar at all the sites. Again, slightly more turbid water up at the north end. Um, and again, we saw some subsurface uh, phytoplankton. So, you know, some patterns there, but I don't think anything, um, uh, you know, nothing particularly noteworthy. All right, so we also uh, measured um, phosphorus at these near shore sites. And this is uh, something uncommon in limnology. Typically, we go out to the deepest part of the lake, and that's where we do our work, and we say it's representative um, of most of the lake. Um, a lot less work is done in the near shore zone, but I think intuitively, most of us expect that nutrient levels and algae levels are going to be higher. Um, we were wrong. Um, this plot shows. Um, different phosphorus forms moving from July into October. We have soluble reactive phosphorus, this little sliver on the bottom, that is phosphorus that cyanobacteria and algae can use directly to support their growth. Dissolved organic phosphorus is a form that they can use, but they need to do some work. You need, you need to have some enzymes to convert that into phosphorus that they can use. And particulate phosphorus is phosphorus associated either with the algae themselves, um, you know, it's in their cells, or attached to inorganic particles, sediment, for example. And when you sum all these up, this top line is total phosphorus. And, uh, the average of that top line of total phosphorus was 11 micrograms per liter. Actually, somewhat lower than what John measured out in the main lake. Um, I was surprised. I would have expected it to be higher. 
And it's noteworthy, this is not a high concentration. Typically, if someone said your total phosphorus concentration in your lake is 11 micrograms per liter, you would say, we're doing great. Um, unfortunately, it appears that that is enough phosphorus to promote uh, algal blooms in a Wasco lake. So that was uh, at Sucker Brook. Now moving further south down to Dutch Hollow Brook, we found somewhat higher concentrations. Actually, the concentrations were the same as John found out, found out in the, the main lake, but the fraction stayed about the same. Pretty low levels of uh, soluble, pho soluble reactive phosphorus. Dissolved organic phosphorus remained fairly constant, and there was an increase in particulate phosphorus toward the end of the year, perhaps associated with uh, cyanobacteria. So we also looked at chlorophyll levels at these same two sites, and here's a time series of chlorophyll um, near Sucker Brook. Average concentration of 2.3 micrograms per liter. Again, that is low. Um, Generally, you would be happy with that, and this is just off the shore. As a matter of fact, it was a little bit lower than was measured out in the main lake. Chlorophyll concentrations were slightly higher at Dutch Hollow Brook, but again, they remained less than was measured out in the main uh, part of Owasco Lake. So we'll attempt to uh, answer a few of our questions. Um, First conclusion is that uh, measurements made just a few hundred feet off the shoreline are not representative and they're not telling us a lot about uh, cyanobacteria accumulations right on the bank. And it appears that just modest levels of cyanobacteria out in the main lake uh, can result in, in major blooms, if you will, on the shoreline. And it, it appears that these accumulations are largely the result of prevailing winds. Um, winds are mostly out of the south, and uh, the, 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 the limited cyanobacteria levels we have in the lake uh, just, just uh, are accumulated in the north end. Uh, we saw fairly modest variations in water quality down the main axis of the lake. Uh, we did see some peaks in algal biomass um, at depth. Nutrient concentrations and chlorophyll concentrations um, were low and uh, actually somewhat lower than what is recorded out in the main lake. And uh, finally, we, we saw no evidence for localized triggers for algal blooms. It appears that they aren't just formed on the shoreline. It appears that they're formed largely lake-wide or in large areas of the lake and are uh, accumulated on the shoreline due to the prevailing winds. And that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, hook up with me uh, afterward. Thanks. <laughs>